This is Bold Dominion, a state politics explainer for a changing Virginia. I'm Nathan Moore. You're listening to this show right now, thanks to high-speed internet. In fact, pretty much the entire podcast industry is built on fast internet. And as awesome as this podcast may be, I know that there's a whole lot more that makes high-speed internet indispensable for modern life. I mean, during the pandemic, we all know that school, work, health, and social life pretty much all moved online. Access to the internet was, and still is, a must. That made life awfully challenging for families where high-speed internet was not available. That's especially in rural areas. Whether it's grades, or income, or health, unequal internet access carries big costs. Some good news for once on this show. There is political movement on some solutions. The 2021 Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act allotted $65 billion to expand internet access across the country. That's through a program called Broadband Equity Access and Deployment, or BEAD. In this nationwide push, Virginia has emerged as a leader. Our Commonwealth was prioritizing broadband access way before BEAD. As governor, Ralph Northam set a goal to get all of Virginia communities online by 2024, and that has been continued by Glenn Youngkin. As other states receive bead funding, experts are advising them to follow Virginia's footsteps. So what are we doing right here in Virginia? Well, to help answer this question, we talked to Dr. Tamara Holmes. She's the director of broadband at the Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development. Her office oversees the Virginia Telecommunications Initiative, which is the program aiding broadband expansion in the state. But first, we turn to Christopher Ali. He's a professor of telecommunications at Penn State University, where his research focuses on broadband policy and deployment in the United States. He talked with Bold Dominion assistant producer Britton Graber about the urban-rural digital divide, the consequences of that disparity, and what it would take to narrow the gap. One of the things that often happens when we think about broadband is that we do tend to reduce it entirely to being a rural issue, right? Like rural Americans don't have it, everyone else does. And increasingly, as I've been in this space, I mean, one of the things I'm becoming quite sensitive to is the fact that the digital divide or digital divides exist everywhere inequality exists. So low-income households in urban areas are just as likely as low-income households in rural areas not to have connectivity. In fact, there are more people lacking connectivity because they can't afford it than because of an infrastructure issue. But when we're talking specifically about rural communities or remote communities and tribal communities, we're oftentimes talking about a problem of infrastructure. There just isn't the connection available. There's no wires in the ground. There's no towers in the sky ready to transmit any sort of signal. And so when we think about policy, one of the reasons why policy focuses so much on the rural issue is because it is very expensive to deploy broadband to rural areas, there's a lot of space, there's not a lot of people, which means you don't have a huge customer base. And so the federal government has taken to subsidizing a lot of this broadband deployment in rural areas, just in the same way that they do it for affordability. So there's something called the Affordable Connectivity Program that subsidizes broadband to $30 a month for low-income households. And it doesn't matter if you're rural or urban, and if you're on tribal land, it's $75 a month. Wow, okay, interesting. So then like, I guess not even just in rural communities, but holistically, would you have an estimate for who or like the amount or percentage of people or households that you say are unserved in the U.S.? And then how would you define unserved, I suppose? So that is I mean, that is a great question. And in fact, that's the sixty five billion dollar question going through Congress right now, because one of the frustrating things is that we actually don't know who is un- and underconnected because we've been living for about a decade with really awful broadband maps. The Federal Communications Commission, to its credit, is trying to change that. So the FCC will tell you that 19 million Americans are unserved. Most numbers put that closer to 42 million unserved and up to 120 million underserved. So let's think about unserved as not having any access, period. Let's think about underserved as being not able to do the types of activities that we might all enjoy, like streaming or a Zoom call or your homework or downloading a PowerPoint or uploading a document. And that number, that 120 million comes from Microsoft, actually, who is saying that, yeah, upwards of one third of the American population do not access the Internet at broadband speeds. And I should say that right now broadband is defined, and this is getting a little technical, 
at 25 megabits per second download, three megabits per second upload. So it's, you'll often see 25 slash three to describe the definition of broadband. And those are numbers of, of speed, right? So it's, do you have enough speed coming into your home Wi-Fi network to binge Murder, She Wrote or to do a Zoom call? 25.3 is a very, very low bar. You're probably good if you're a single person living in an apartment and you could stream, you could do an email at 25.3, you're not gonna have a problem. If you're any more than one person, 25.3 will slow down dramatically, especially as we learned during the pandemic when a lot of roommates needed to be on a class Zoom calls or a lot of neighborhoods were working from home and then you saw a dramatic slowdown in the network. Right. And I was going to say, it's sort of been talked about in the past, broadband and, um, you know, access has sort of been treated as like a bit of a luxury. And I think that we're seeing after COVID especially, and I mean, there's questions about why did it take so long to sort of realize this, that it's more of a necessity. And that's where we're seeing things like the Federal Broadband Equity Accessibility Deployment Program. Can you tell our listeners a little bit about that program and what are some of the spending guidelines? How is that impacting all of this? Yeah, absolutely. So I think you're, you're absolutely right on this point that if of all the awfulness and of the pain and the heartbreak and the devastation caused by the coronavirus pandemic, if there's if one thing it did do is get us all on board with the fact that broadband is not a luxury, it is a need, it is a necessity, it is a utility, some even call it a right, that it's not just a nice to have. This is how we navigate the world in 2022. So we were all in agreement there. And then, but it also turned out that, you know, 42 million people couldn't access the internet during the pandemic. What are we going to do? So in 2021, Congress passes the Infrastructure Act. And along that came $65 billion for broadband earmarked in a couple of programs. The largest earmark is $42.5 billion for something called the BEAD program, the Broadband Equity Accessibility and Deployment Program. And this is going to be managed by an organization called the NTIA, the National Telecommunications and Information Administration, which is a little known entity in the White House that nobody has heard about before. And suddenly they're going to have all this money. And the really interesting thing with this money is that every state is guaranteed $100 million dollars. And then the NTIA will dole out the rest of the money based on these new FCC maps that we were just talking about. And then the money will go to states and every state broadband office will then decide how to manage that money, right? So we're looking at a state like Texas getting about $3 billion for broadband. And then what's likely to happen is that each state will develop a grant program that you'd have to submit a provider or a public-private partnership would have to submit a bid for. One thing that I'm pretty excited about in the BEAD program is that it also requires every state to have a five-year broadband and digital equity plan. So we're not just shooting in the dark here. We're really looking towards efficient planning policy development. So that's the biggest chunk of money is this $42 billion. Then we've got $14 billion for the Affordable Connectivity Program, which we've already talked about. $30 a month for low-income families, $75 a month on tribal land, and $100 flat out for hardware purchases like a laptop or a computer or a tablet. This is great. Americans pay the most for broadband uh, in anywhere in the developed world. We need to make it easier for low-income families. There is a concern, though, that this money is going to run out in 2025. And then are we leaving all of these families on the hook? Because their bills are suddenly going to go up by $30 a month which a lot of families can't afford. So there is some talk around how do we make this program permanent rather than just, you know, kind of a one-off 14 billion. So there's, yeah, 42 billion for deployment, 14 billion for affordability, and then 2.75 billion for digital equity and inclusion efforts. And that would include things like workforce development and training, skills, programs like digital navigator programs where people are trained to help homebound folks about how to just kind of navigate the ins and outs of digital connectivity. And this is also really important because I I, I see the digital divide as having three tripods. There's a tripod about access. Can you access a network? Are there wires in the ground? Then there's affordability. Can you afford the network that is passing by your house? And the third is, do you know how to use the network? Because quite frankly, a broadband connection at any price is useless unless you know how to use it. And this is something that I think went underappreciated during the pandemic is that folks couldn't book vaccines, right? They didn't know how. They couldn't order their groceries online. 
right? Things that we take for granted. Again, I talked about the digital divide being about inequality and inequity. I mean, who is most likely not to have the digital literacy necessary? We're talking about seniors. We're talking about low-income households. We're often talking about minority communities, right? The same communities that are constantly disenfranchised in this country are then doubly disenfranchised now without, you know, the infrastructure or the affordability programs or the skills and and literacy development. And this needs to stop because this is just exacerbating all of these social inequalities that are on the tip of our tongues these days. Right, right, exactly. So then I guess moving specifically to how states are going to tackle this problem. Well, and specifically, I know that there's been talk about how Virginia's kind of proven that it's necessary and really beneficial to partner with larger internet providers. Are you seeing any other or, you know, similar business models that are working for states or that you think will work best? I am always skeptical of big national providers. They make a lot of promises and they take a lot of money and they I find they don't deliver. So where I'm seeing a couple things, when we're thinking about specifically about Virginia, you're absolutely right. Virginia has launched itself into being a deployment pioneer in this country. And we went from being quite low in broadband deployment to over the pandemic, really pushing out networks. And I think one of the the really cool things that I love talking about and celebrating here in Virginia about this is the use of electric cooperatives, right? You have these electric utility companies that are very trusted in their communities that have experience with customer service, with getting connectivity out there. And now what they're doing is they're putting fiber to the ground or fiber in the air through their electricity poles. So the Central Virginia Electric Cooperative has a company called Firefly Broadband in Nelson that is doing incredible work connecting 13 counties, including Albemarle, which is where the University of Virginia is, Prince George Electric Cooperative in Surrey County, Rappahannock Electric Cooperative in the north. These are awesome. So my advice to everyone listening is you want broadband, go local. Where I'm seeing a lot of concern, though, is there is a specific clause in the BEAD program that says that a state is not allowed to disqualify a municipality from offering broadband or from receiving this money. We're seeing a trend towards municipal provision of broadband, as in public broadband. So the municipality will create a broadband provider. Now, you know, it's not free, but it's owned by the city. This is banned in 18 states right now. And it's actually quite difficult to do in Virginia. Right now, there are nine municipal or county networks. The concern now is that we're actually seeing a few more states put legislation on the books banning money going to municipalities for broadband. And the question a lot of us policy folks are looking at is whether or not that is in violation of the bead program rules and whether or not those laws on the books will disqualify the state from getting bead money because it specifically says you cannot disqualify, you cannot discriminate against municipalities. Obviously, the bead program was written to push these states to allow municipal broadband. I think so. I think they was intentionally written this way. In fact, an earlier draft of the Infrastructure Act didn't say uh, states can't discriminate against municipal provision. It actually said states should prioritize municipal provision, which is a really interesting turn of phrase. And Treasury also tried to do something like that as well. So yeah, so we've got, we've got some really interesting tensions here. And it's going to be interesting once states file their five-year broadband plans what they're going to say about municipal broadband. And I should add, there's a lot of controversy around municipal broadband. I'm obviously a fan of it. The controversy with it is providers will say, especially the large providers, that it's distorting the free market, right? That you have a public entity competing against private providers. What I've seen, however, is that there is no example that I can find in which a municipality is satisfied with their broadband provider and then decides to build a municipal broadband network on top of it. That doesn't happen. Municipalities only use this as a last option when they are so unsatisfied with their incumbent provider or there is no incumbent provider and no one is willing to come into this community. And oftentimes this is for very rural remote areas. And we see this again in Virginia. So this is not a distortion of the free market. This is not about taking money away from giant corporations, although I'm always for that. This is really about local empowerment and and connectivity because, you know, something I, I talk about in my book and most of the speeches I give is at the end of the day, broadband is about people. It's not about money. It's not about technology. It's not about policy. It's not about AT&T or Comcast. It's about people. 
Right. And in this day and age, too. So I guess now let's take it back and sort of just maybe talk a little bit about the individual impacts that the digital divide is having on certain facets of society. I mean, there's so much to talk about here. One of the interesting studies came out from the National Bureau of Economic Research and National Economic Research Bureau, I can't remember the acronym right now. And they found that folks with a affordable high speed broadband network at home were more likely to social distance. In and of itself, that suggests that broadband is a matter of life and death during the pandemic, right? But again, who was not likely to be able to do this, right? Folks who couldn't work from home either because of their employment or because they didn't have the connectivity. So I'm just going to back up a second. We also have a workforce shortage. So I am really excited that the digital equity program allows for workforce training and retraining. And I think this is going to be particularly important in Appalachia, where we're trying to move away from, you know, natural resource extraction. When it comes to education, scholars have found that students with a broadband subscription at home will likely have half a letter grade higher GPA than those without. We talk a lot about K through 12, but we often don't talk about the digital divide in post-secondary institutions. And one thing I found right when the pandemic started, and I was still a professor at the University of Virginia, I was teaching a class and 50% of my students could not do a Zoom call because they went home to rural areas. And so I ended up pivoting my class and we did a like 1990 style chat class. Every Wednesday we met and we literally typed at each other because I think it's so important to meet our communities where they are rather than force them to do things, you know, force them to meet where we think they should be. And and that's what I try to do with my students. So, okay, so that's all that's workforce and that's education. Farming is right up there with the importance of connectivity. We often don't think about farmers being technologically savvy, except they are totally technologically savvy. They are amazing. And one of the things that's gonna be so crucial is that we need to double the food supply in the next 50 years. But we're out of land. Like there is no more arable land in the United States. What does that mean? We need to farm smarter. We need to farm more efficiently, more precisely. The way that we do that, digital technology. And what does digital technology need? Broadband. And this actually brings up a really interesting situation where we often talk about fiber, 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 right? Fiber optics, future-proof, gold standard, everybody needs fiber. And like, yes, I would love everyone to have fiber. Farms can't have fiber because by definition, farm communication has to be wireless. I know it sounds trite, but you can't plug a combine in to a fiber optic cable, right? As we're pushing fiber to everywhere, we need to be also developing high-capacity wireless solutions to make sure that these very sophisticated pieces of technology have the connectivity they need. And this is one of the areas that I find we really don't talk enough about because we think about farmland as being uninhabited, right? So it's not about people. So we don't, for instance, map farm broadband, which is ridiculous because we need these areas covered and they need to be covered with high capacity wireless solutions. Yeah, absolutely. And I think your point about how much food we're going to need to be thinking, I mean, what a motivator right there. So then I guess kind of wrapping up, how can states involve communities and their communities in helping the process of providing broadband access? There's a lot we can do. One of the things I talked about that every state has to file a five-year broadband plan with the NTIA. By law, those plans have to be crafted in cooperation with localities and regions. So there is immediately an opportunity. The other thing we can do is just keep in contact with our elected officials. Keep broadband on the agenda because there's going to be times in which broadband is no longer sexy, but we don't still don't have it, right? We need to keep that kind of pressure up to remind our elected officials that we are still un- and underconnected. Other things folks can do, if they're worried about their connectivity, do a speed test. You can go to speedtest.net. It's a trusted site, and you can figure out, does what I'm receiving match what I'm paying for? So, you know, we can educate ourselves, we can educate our neighbors, and we can keep the pressure on our elected officials, and we can actively get involved, go to these meetings, and also educate ourselves about things like the Affordable Connectivity Program. You know, there's a lot we can do. So just as a final question, what do you envision our country, our states, our communities looking like if we were successfully able to bridge the digital divide? Yeah, you know, what I'm going to say is sound pessimistic, but I promise it's not. $42 billion is not enough, but it is enough to make a massive dent. And I think that's really important to understand because it's just simply not enough money. But we can do a tremendous amount of good with it. A lot of eyes are going to be on states. 
to be proper stewards of this public money. But the other thing to think long term about the digital divide and those three kind of pillars, right? Skills, accessibility, affordability. I don't think we will ever solve the digital divide because new technology will always get rolled out to urban wealthy areas before they get rolled out to rural remote tribal areas or low income households or minority households until we actually solve structural inequality, right? And I think this to me is an invitation for us to keep going, to to not rest on our laurels that we've got 42 billion and the solution is going to be over, that we need to keep doing this. And in 10 years, when all that money is spent and all these networks are built, we're still going to need to subsidize broadband for low-income families. We're still going to need to subsidize operation expenses for rural providers because there's no market there, right? So let's develop exciting sustainable long-term solutions to the digital divide rather than thinking this is a one-off. Thanks, Congress. We're done after 42 billion. That was Christopher Ali, professor of telecommunications at Penn State University. Stay with us. After a short break, we'll talk with Tamara Holmes about what it takes to get Virginians online. You're listening to Bold Dominion, a state politics explainer for Changing Virginia. Visit us online at bolddominion.org. Hey, if you've ever had a question about state politics, let us know. Maybe we'll do a show about it. Shoot us an email at bolddominion at virginia.edu. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever fine podcasts are served up. Go ahead and subscribe. Leave us a nice review while you're there. Bold Dominion is a member of Virginia Audio Collective, online at virginiaaudio.org. You can check out all the podcasts from the collective, from science to history to music to community affairs. We amplify the voices of people in our community and help them tell stories that matter. You can listen and subscribe at virginiaaudio.org. Welcome back. In the second half of today's show, we're talking with Dr. Tamara Holmes. She's the Director of Broadband at the Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development. She talked with Bold Dominion's Katherine Hansen about how broadband access is expanding in Virginia. She starts by explaining how the broadband office came to be. Ironically, we've had a last mile deployment program for broadband that goes back to 2017. So we had a a broadband program before we actually had an office. And so the Virginia Telecommunication Initiative, which is our largest, which is our primary vehicle for broadband expansion in the Commonwealth, was created in 2017 and then the office was created in 2019 and so I actually Vadi was one of my programs when I was under my previous position and then as the program grew feet and the budget got larger I was asked was I interested in taking over the broadband program full-time and so I stepped over in September of 2019 along with one staffer to continue managing the Vadi program and so since then we've grown our budget significantly from a million, it was a million, million, four million, 19 million, 50 million, 750 million. And so our staff has grown from an office of two folks back in 2019 up to an office of 12. Wow. Okay. So a lot's happened in three years. Yes. <laughs> right. Uh, you mentioned the Vadi program. Can you tell yes. us a little bit more about that? Yes. Yeah, so Vadi is a program that was established by the General Assembly back in 2017. And the primary purpose of Vadi, it requires a public-private partnership for broadband expansion to areas that are defined as unserved in the Commonwealth. And so that definition has changed over time since 2017. And so currently, we define any areas as unserved that are receiving speeds below 100 over 20. And so that's how we currently look at broadband within the Commonwealth. So I tried to do some preliminary reading before this interview, and I sort of looked at uh, the federal program, you know, the Broadband Equity Access and Deployment Program, BEAD. Can you tell us a little bit more about that federal funding and how that impacts your work? Yes. And so I have 21. Ironically, when I took over the broadband program, as you heard me say earlier, it was a state funded, it was general fund dollars. And so I went from running primarily federal programs and a little bit of state programs to running a fully funded state program. And so over the last year, I've had to transition and put my federal hat back on. And so with the new bead funding, there are several federal rules that we will have to follow with utilizing the bead money for different different uses. Because remember, I said it can be used for deployment, but also there's some non-deployment opportunities there. And so the thing that 
we're working through, which we've done, is basically taking what is a state program and figuring out ways. It's kind of like square peg, round hole. So it's taking our body program and finding the things that we currently do and how they fit within the federal rules. And then where we don't fit within the federal rules, adopting those rules within our program. I'm confident that we will be able to utilize the forthcoming bead funding to continue closing the digital divide in Virginia and just really have to tweak our state program to fit fully within the federal program. Now, the good thing is I still have a state allocation. And so that still allows us some flexibility because there are some rules within the bead funding where there's an appearance of a favoritism towards fiber. And so in Virginia, we're technology agnostic. And so we invest in all project types it's not a top-down approach, it's a bottoms-up approach. And so we wanna make sure that technology that's deployed within the Commonwealth fit the needs of the residents in those communities. And so the, the bead funding has some criteria around the type of technology, but there are some opportunities through bead if necessary, they call them waivers. So there are some opportunities to get waivers on some of the federal rules if we need them. Okay, so you, you kind of answered my next question. I was just gonna ask how you mitigate the needs of different communities in Virginia with the guidelines? Is that where you sort of do the puzzle of state versus federal funding? So we in Virginia, and this is something we've done since VADI was created, it's really putting the local communities in the driving seat when it comes to what are the best solutions within their communities. And often it may take more than one technology type to address the digital divide within a community. And so we've had communities, even with the most recent round of applications that were awarded last year, we have some communities pick four different providers with three different technology types to ensure that universal coverage was, is within their community. Okay. I'd love to sort of move forward into the implementation of this. You know, I'll be the first to admit that I'm a little technologically inept. So I, I need this too. Could you sort of go over the different technologies that are involved in this? Sure. And so I am not an engineer by trade. I know enough to be dangerous, right? And so what we've seen deployed primarily in the state through body have been fixed wireless projects. And so those are projects, of course, where there's a tower built within a community. And so then there's a wireless signal that's propagated throughout a particular area and folks get access that way. The other way is cable. You can also get, um, it's called coax cable. And so coax cable can be deployed to homes, businesses, community anchors, and then also fiber. And so both coax cable and fiber are both wireline connections. And then the fixed wireless, of course, is a wireless connection. And so those are the primary technologies that have been deployed within the Commonwealth using the body program. That's probably like the bare minimum I'm going to be able to explain. No, 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 that's perfect. We're just looking for beginner level information. <laughs> so you mentioned that the FCC is doing mapping for unserved areas. Does your department also work on that? So um, we did in April of this year, launch the state's broadband availability map. We built that map in partnership with the Virginia Tech Center for Geospatial Information Technology. And so there was a bill passed in 2021 that allows us to get data directly from private internet service providers of where they currently serve by location. And so we've been able to take that data and put it on a map. It's called the Commonwealth Connection Map. And so that was our first foray in collecting more granular data on broadband access within the state. Mm -hmm. You talked about sort of non-deployment factors like affordability and the reliability. What's the process of making internet affordable and reliable to these communities? So Governor Youngkin is really committed to ensuring that every Virginian has access to affordable, reliable, and high-speed internet. And so this past General Assembly session, there was a bill that was proposed. It's House Bill 1265, and it's called the Broadband Affordability and Cost-Effectiveness Plan. This bill was signed in legislation by Governor Youngkin, and so Virginia is kind of a little bit ahead of the curve, I like to say, than the federal programs. And the reason I say that is because we're currently working on a study to look at the issue around affordability and cost-effectiveness within the Commonwealth. And so it's kind of a precursor to what was also passed by Congress under the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, Digital Equity Act. And so NTIA not only has the BEAD program, which we talked a little bit about earlier, it also has a digital equity component. Body has been our primary vehicle for broadband expansion. And so it's primarily focused on lack of access due to infrastructure. With the digital equity funding, along with the broadband affordability and cost effectiveness plan that we're currently working on, we'll be able to look at how access is impacted by affordability 
concerns. And so at the same time as we completely close the digital divide under the Yunkin administration from an access infrastructure standpoint, we'll be able to start really looking and have an understanding of how affordability impacts access and be able to identify what are some best practices and ways we can implement programs to help address affordability. And so I know you've probably heard about the Affordable Connectivity Program. That is a federal subsidy that's paid out by the FCC, $30 a month to cover costs for eligible households. The same requirement, as far as I know, is a part of the new BEAD funding that will be forthcoming. And so through the digital equity work and our broadband affordability and cost-effectiveness plan, we want to assess how we're doing as a commonwealth with one, taking advantage of the federal resource, but two, what are some other issues around broadband affordability and how do we address those? And so that new funding through NTIA, through the digital equity program will allow us to start being able to look at that. And then there's funding available for implementation. So there's planning, implementation, and then there's a competitive pot of money that NCIA will administer that anyone within the Commonwealth would have access to apply for. And so we'll have state money and that'll also still be money at the federal level. Okay. And I just want to ask some bigger picture questions. How does the digital divide affect communities in Virginia? Well, we saw a lot through, you know, the the height of the pandemic where families did have access within their homes. And so they might have been utilizing local businesses and folks weren't able to do telehealth visits. And so we like to say Virginia was doing broadband before it was cool. And so even at the start of the pandemic, there were hundreds of thousands of communities that had access to broadband based on prior investments and not just investments from the body program, but the tobacco commission has invested in, in broadband as well. Other, you know, state and federal resources have invested in broadband. And so it's important for families to be able to learn, work and do business from home or from within their respective communities. And so we see broadband being a priority to ensure that folks have access to all kinds of things. Um, and so with the new broadband map and the investments we've made through VADI, you're able to see, you know, communities that currently lack access with our investments, where they will be in the next three years, which is based on some of how the projects are being built out. Okay. You know, since your office was formed in 2019, what would you say has changed? Like how has the digital divide shrunk over the last three years in Virginia? So under the Yunkin administration, we did change the definition of unserved. So last year, anything that was considered unserved was below 25 over three. And so in the last last eight months, we've changed the definition of anything below 100 over 20. And so now we've identified additional locations that lack access to 100 over 20. And so I would like to say we've kind of moved the needle a little further so that we've identified more locations that need access. Um, But also we were deploying higher speeds. And so we're in ensuring that every Virginian has what is considered reliable high-speed internet as well. And so what I'd like to say is that we've identified basically throughout the pandemic that certain speeds are not reliable. And so we're looking at ensuring that every Virginian has access to higher reliable speeds. The other thing is that through the VADI program, every year we make investments, less families or less households need access. And so we are about, I think based on our new data, about 210,000 locations lack access to 100 over 20. And so we're we're steadily getting the job done. Tamara Holmes is the Director of Broadband at the Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development. Thanks to her and also to Christopher Ali, Professor of Telecommunications at Penn State University. My name's Nathan Moore and I'm the host of Bold Dominion. Our show this week was produced and edited by Alana Bittner. Thanks also to our assistant producers, Britton Graber and Katherine Hansen. You can find us online at bolddominion.org. And don't forget to subscribe. It's just a click away. 